A very brief word before we start the show, we have a survey in the show notes. It'll take you a couple minutes to fill out, and it will help us find the stories that are most relevant to you. And I also want to tell you about a podcast that's really relevant to you. It's called As She Rises. We're constantly grappling on this show about how to talk about climate change. Sometimes it feels untouchable. Other times we're so close to it, it feels exhausting. From Wonder Media Network comes season two of As She Rises. It's a podcast centered on native voices and women of color that personalizes the elusive magnitude of climate change. It's hosted by Grace Lynch. And As She Rises combines poetry and storytelling to offer an intimate look at the climate crisis. Each week, you'll hear from poets and experts local to one place in the U.S. and territories, from the Florida wetlands to the coral reefs of American Samoa to the Pueblo Nation, You'll learn how climate change is affecting hometowns and what communities are doing to address it. Listen and follow As She Rises wherever you get your podcasts. From the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. For a long time, I thought the uproar about the climate impact of cryptocurrency, mostly Bitcoin, was a bunch of concern trolling. Yes, the energy trend is obvious. Bitcoin mining today uses a half percent of the world's electricity. And every year, as more shipping containers and warehouses full of high-powered computers are deployed to unlock more Bitcoin, energy use grows by double digits. A few years back, a bunch of experts saw this trend coming and warned about it. By 2017, Bitcoin was using as much energy as Denmark or Ireland. And some groups picked this up and extrapolated wild scenarios. The World Economic Forum wrote a story in 2017 with the panicked headline, In 2020, Bitcoin will consume more power than the world does today. And when I saw that, it brought me back to the early days of the internet, when some experts thought that data centers were going to suck up all our electricity supply. There were claims in the 90s that the internet would use half of America's electricity in the 2010s. And what happened? Well, data centers, these giant computers that make the internet possible, got wildly more efficient. They use 1% of electricity globally, and that number has basically stayed the same even as internet traffic grew 15-fold since 2010. And so last year, when Elon Musk came under fire for accepting Bitcoin as a payment method for cars and batteries and solar systems at Tesla, I shrugged my shoulders. We know there's an energy cost to our digital lives, so why would we get so panicked about Bitcoin? Now, I'm a crypto agnostic. I don't personally own any Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. If I ever own any, I will be a very late adopter. But I'm very interested in the underlying tech in the emerging subcultures. And I'm now waking up to the energy consequences. Things shifted around last May when Elon Musk backtracked on his decision to take Bitcoin. And he tweeted this graph of off-the-chart spikes in energy use from Bitcoin mining, calling it insane. He said the system relied too much on coal. Uber also said it would halt plans to accept crypto for payment because of climate concerns. And then I started seeing these stats that blew my mind. Energy use of Bitcoin mining has increased tenfold in the last five years. One mined Bitcoin could use anywhere from 8 to 13 years worth of household electricity. And if you want to trade that Bitcoin or use it to buy something, no matter how small, that single transaction could use enough energy to power an American home for six weeks. So data centers, these supercomputers that literally make everything online possible, are using only a percent of global electricity. And Bitcoin, this hyper-specific network, is already at half that. And there's a constant frenzy to find new power plants to feed new mining operations. And then I read a story that really hit me about how this is playing out in the real world. So where this is happening is in this area of New York called the Finger Lakes. There are 11 Finger Lakes that stretch across New York. And you get there and you see, I mean, the natural beauty in this place is just unreal. I ended up getting up one morning and going out to the lake just to kind of like take in the sort of scenery as the sun rose over it. It's just absolutely stunning to watch the sunrise and see these vineyards across the lakes. And so to get this industrial Bitcoin operation happening there, it's just completely incongruous. This is Brian Kahn. He's a climate technology editor at Protocol. And about a year ago, he got wind of a story about how Bitcoin miners are reviving a zombie natural gas plant in upstate New York. So we went there. On the shores of Seneca Lake, a retired power plant has reawakened, now pumping out half a billion pounds of CO2 a year. Not because this community needs electricity. Its main purpose, powering thousands of computers 24-7, mining Bitcoin. 
So why this particular mine? What was unique about the relationship between this mine and the power plant and the location? So this particular mine is interesting for a few reasons. So it's called the Greenwich Power Plant. This is a power plant that was a coal plant that was built in the 1960s on the Finger Lakes. It shut down the 2010s because it wasn't economical to burn coal anymore. And then it got bought out by this private equity firm. And they said, we're gonna turn it into a peaker gas plant. So we're gonna put power on the grid when we need extra power. They quickly found out that was also not a really economically feasible business model. And that's when the crypto mining came in. For years now, Kim and Neil Holtzman have lived peacefully in the Seneca Lake region, but recently their quiet sanctuary has been disturbed. At a quiet night when it used to be so peaceful, we hear a deep rumble, um, like a a freight train. There's just constant, this low-level hum of noise um, happening from all these computers working in the background to essentially search for magical internet money. Natural beauty on one end and just pure industrial brute computing strength on the other. This is not a one-off story. What Brian saw on Lake Seneca is unfolding across the U.S. Coal and gas power plants that are under pressure in Ohio, Montana, Pennsylvania, and even elsewhere in New York are now getting an economic lifeline thanks to partnerships with Bitcoin miners. I think the other thing that really got me intrigued by it, though, was just the fact that this was happening in this place where there are a lot of other plants that looked a lot like what Greenwich was. There are a lot of shuttered power plants or a lot of power plants that can't really generate revenue for their owners. And so what's happening at Greenwich could end up being a template for power plants across upstate New York and across the Northeast. This is The Carbon Copy. I'm Stephen Lacey. The companies that own dying dirty power plants see a chance to extend their lives, all thanks to cryptocurrency. This week, how Bitcoin mining is locking in fossil fuels and what could change it. America's green banks are preparing to unleash a wave of capital for clean energy. The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund invests a historic $27 billion in projects nationwide. This could mobilize up to $150 billion of private capital for solar, storage, efficiency, and electrification in underserved communities. So how do we deploy those billions quickly, efficiently, and with the highest impact? On July 18th, Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure will host a virtual event exploring the -the on-the-ground realities of making America's green banks a success. Register for free by clicking the link in the show notes or go to latitudemedia.com slash events. Clean energy and climate tech are policy-driven industries, and anyone working in this field touches local, state, and federal policy in a very real way. And that's why you should be listening to Political Climate, a podcast from Latitude Media and Boundary Stone Partners that delivers an insider's view on climate policy and politics. Every other week, co-hosts Julia Piper, Emily Dominich, and Brandon Hurlbuck cover the nuances of government funding, regulations, backroom negotiations, and the election, of course. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations and strong opinions from voices across the political spectrum. Listen at latitudemedia.com or subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts. When does the world of crypto come into your climate reporting for the first time? When did you start paying attention to to Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency world? (laughs) That's good. I wonder, I should go back and look and see in the archives. I mean, I think it started, you know, a couple of years ago and people started looking at like what was going on in, you know, in China specifically. That's where a lot of crypto mining was happening at the time. And so I guess what, maybe 2018, 2019 is when it sort of got on my radar as a thing to sort of watch given the emissions. And it's been wild to watch them just curve up and up and up. The more interest there has been in crypto, probably because people maybe like me are writing about it. People are like, oh, I want to know more about that. Oh, I can make money, um, whatever it might be. So that's when it really, that's when it started. Right, you've heard these terms by now, Bitcoin mining, the blockchain, Dogecoin. Cryptocurrency is having a notable impact on the world's financial markets, but it's also affecting the environment. What is unique about the way Bitcoin is mined that makes it so energy intensive and requires a mining operator to go to a massive power plant and require almost all their energy? So the way you mine a Bitcoin is essentially you have to solve your, not you, although I guess you could do it if you were really uh, smart not and fast. Me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not me either. I did not do good in math. But what you do is you essentially have to solve a math equation. And you have a bunch of computers to do that. 
everyone's trying to solve the same equation at the same time. And all these computers are running to do the same thing. And if you want to have the best chance at solving it and about what then is called minting the block, you want to have more computing power. And so to get more power, more computing power, you need more electricity power. And to do to make the most money, you want to do that in the cheapest way possible. So these are the turbines here that actually create the energy. And then literally right next to it, you will have computers that are mining Bitcoin. Um, at any given point, there are computers running across this planet, all trying to mine Bitcoin. And they're all racing each other. And the reason it wastes so much energy is because they're all working for the same thing. Um, they're all trying to solve that same problem. And only one computer ends up solving it. So we're sitting here talking on a Google Meet call. There's a carbon cost to do, streaming a, a, a video over a data center. The, everything that we do online has a carbon cost in some way. Why crypto? What What is different about what's happening in that world? You know, when it comes to these big tech companies, like Google, for example, like they want to get to net zero. They want to get to 100% renewables. That is like a centralized decision that Google is making. For crypto and for cryptocurrency mining in particular, no one's making centralized decisions necessarily. Um, instead, it's this decentralized decision-making process where everyone is actually like, okay, like what's the cheapest way to get the most cash out of this, to generate the most Bitcoins possible? And to do that requires, I mean, in a lot of cases, fossil fuel energy. And so that I think is what's really interesting is that there's no one saying like, crypto has got to be 100% green or it's got to be 100% dirty. There's just a bunch of people making decisions right now. And a lot of them lead to extremely high energy use and sort of rising emissions as well. So how did you end up this winter in the middle of New York in the Finger Lakes? I thought it'd be a cool place to take a vacation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> everyone loves the Finger Lakes upstate New York in winter, right? <laughs> um, no, I've honestly, so I've been looking at this Bitcoin mine that started growing there for, I guess, a little over a year. But it allowed me to watch what was going on over that time period and to see it you know, expanding and growing and becoming this much bigger you know, operation than it was initially. And so by the time I was able to get up there this winter, you know, we saw, what we saw was essentially this power plant that was generating some power and also crypto mining on the side become essentially a full-fledged crypto mine for the majority of its time using massive amounts of power to mine for Bitcoin. And so it was like this moment where there was a really strong inflection point where this mine had grown to a huge scale and there was a big decision coming down on whether it would be able to continue operating. We were shown this server room where you need ear protection to shield the deafening roar. The Greenwich power plant shut down permanently in 2011 because there just wasn't the demand. But Bitcoin mining has given it new life. Now companies across the country are looking at doing the same thing. You use this term, zombie power plants. What do you mean by that? I mean, there are just a lot of undead power plants in upstate New York. There are plants that are either nearing the end of their operational life because it's just not efficient to operate them, or there are plants that have already been shuttered because, again, the economics are just have turned against coal or they just we don't need that power on the grid. Those plants, though, are up for sale. Anything's for sale. Um, it was wild. I didn't know you could buy a power plant, but apparently you can if you have enough money. <laughs> um, so... If, uh, you know, it's, I don't know, I don't think I'm ever going to be there, but maybe someday. But that's the thing is like these plants are all up for sale and you can do anything with them. I mean, you can generate power and that's what they're doing at Greenwich. But there's also this like possibility where you can take it and essentially bring it back to life. Say, hey, we're generating a little bit of power at, you know, X power plant, but then do whatever you want with it instead um, on your own time. It's kind of like a, oh, I got, you know, hobby time. Um, and for them, this hobby is mining Bitcoin. Um, so it's something that, you know, when you look at the power plant itself and look at, you know, the money, if you kind of follow the money, right, you can see where are they making money. And the majority of the money they're making is not when they're putting power onto the grid. When they're, where they're making the most money is what's going on behind the grid. Um, and, you know, their revenue disclosures, it was, you know, essentially a, almost a, I guess a one to eight ratio um, in terms of how much money they're making putting power on the grid versus mining Bitcoin. Calling this a power plant, it's a power plant name only, essentially, at this point. An intake pipe two football fields long cools the 70-year-old turbines with about 100 million gallons of water a day drawn from the lake. The superheated water is discharged into a river, raising fears about the fragile trout and harmful algae blooms. But Greenwich has big plans to ramp up, to mine 26 times as much Bitcoin. So you get there. 
Who do you talk to and what is the reaction to this operation? And what does it say about how people in the community are thinking about this? So there are a number of people that are in opposition to this Bitcoin mine. It's not just, you know, one or two people doing one or two things or that live right in the shadow of this power plant. It's people across the lake. The people I was able to speak with include the founder of Seneca Lake Guardian, this woman, Yvonne Taylor, who was just, you know, she called herself an accidental activist. And I love that because if you think climate activists, you probably have certain, you know, ideas in mind. And she was the opposite of a lot of that. Um, She's just, you know, a speech therapist working with at-risk youth. Someone that wasn't, you know, like a rah-rah climate person. Um, She was just somebody that loved this place. Her family had lived there for seven generations. It meant so much to her. And all these folks said the same thing. Like, it's not that they're opposed to cryptocurrency. They're not opposed to thinking about the future as that, whatever that may mean. What they want is they want this place to stay special um, and to be protected from the damage done when it comes to cryptocurrency mining that's associated with Bitcoin. And so, you know, the issue for them is like, what do they want their future to be? Do they want to live in the shadow of this Bitcoin mine, cranking out carbon pollution 24-7, making noise pollution, expanding operations? Or do they want to lean into a different future, one that's more sustainable, that's focused on you know, the wine industry and the tens of thousands of jobs it creates? They're really looking at these two competing futures and trying to decide what it is that matters to them. We're going to take a quick break here. And afterward, we'll ask, how big is this problem? And if we can keep internet energy use basically flat, Surely we can find a solution for Bitcoin, right? On July 18th, join Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure as we take a deep dive into the next phase of deploying the $27 billion Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. We'll provide practical insights for the state agencies and local lenders at the front lines of dispensing these funds. Where are the bottlenecks? How do we balance speed with transparency? And can America's green banks live up to the expectations of both local communities and Wall Street? Latitude Media Stephen Lacey, Banyan co-founder Amanda Lee, and Clean Energy Fund of Texas EVP Billy Briscoe will answer these questions and more on July 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. This is a must-attend for project developers and financiers. Register for free at latitudemedia.com slash events or click the link in the show notes. I'm Julia Piper. I'm Brandon Hurlbut. And I'm Emily Dominich. A little over a year ago, political climate took a break so we could focus on the groundwork of implementing America's biggest ever climate bill the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm excited to say, political climate is back. And I'll be joined by my two co-hosts to riff on the top political stories and insider scoops from state houses to the halls of Congress to regulatory agencies and even international climate talks. We'll explain how those developments are driving industry decisions today. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations. And to learn about how energy and climate policy is shaped within both political parties from the people who have actually helped shape it. So join me, Brandon and Emily, every other week, starting in April, for fresh episodes of Political Climate. Subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. So here's the thing about mining Bitcoin. It doesn't have to use so much electricity. And mining operations don't have to be connected to old coal or gas plants. That's just the consequence of this mad scramble to get power as quickly as possible. There are lots of other cryptocurrencies that use a fraction of the electricity that Bitcoin does. It's all about the mining method. Remember that big race we talked about earlier in the show where computers solve math problems in order to mint new bitcoins? That race gobbles up a lot of computing and electrical power. It turns out, though, there's a different way to mine that uses a fraction of the energy. This is the most difficult part of the interview because I want you to explain proof of work versus proof of stake (laughs) in a way that non-crypto people will understand and actually care about. Oh, God. Uh, That is the most difficult part. (laughs) Uh, am I allowed to swear? No. (laughs) So whatever gets you through it. Okay. Okay. We're going to see what we got here. Um, (laughs) so proof of work is essentially like, it's a race where everyone's running to try to capture the flag. Um, so if you imagine like a bunch of people running to try to just get, capture the flag, it's uses a ton of energy. That's what proof of work is essentially. Um, and only one person ends up capturing the flag. Proof of stake is a lot different. Everyone lines up at the starting line to go capture the flag. But instead of everyone making a run, random person at the end sort of spins around three times and then points at someone and says, you go do it. And only one person goes to get the flag. So we've just saved a ton of energy. And that's what proof of stake is essentially. It's like all these computers stand there and they're ready to go help mint that block on the blockchain. 
But instead of all of them trying to do it at once, it's not a competition. Um, instead, it's sort of just like, uh, you know, go ahead. I mean, not everyone's, of course, no one's like, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. So everyone wants to mint that block. But the person that actually does is randomly chosen. And so that cuts down the waste of energy, essentially. That was a miraculously good description. Oh, that literally just like came out of the blue. <laughs> nice work. So, thank you. No, no, no one, no one I've heard explain it can explain it that concisely. So, <laughs> so great work. And what does that mean in terms of energy consumption? What is the difference in actual energy used under both of those models? I mean, it's literally a 99% reduction. That's the, or those are the best estimates. A lot of people would be asking why not make that change? If <laughs> if it's a 99% difference in energy use, why would we not make that change right away? I mean, that's a great question. I think the answer is that there are just really entrenched interests who are already making a lot of money off the system that exists. And so to convince them to make that change um, or to convince enough of them to make the change is, is a tall ask. There's a lot of entropy that works in favor of proof of work with Bitcoin. If you look at Greenwich, for example, Last year, that mine made $88 million. And if you're going to say, hey, guess what? Like, we want to take away that $88 million cash cow. That's a really tough sell to them. Again, like I said, like, we should probably do that anyways, because, you know, there's no money or economy on a dead planet. But that is the that is the reason. Yeah, as I'm hearing that question and that answer, it sounds a lot like the fossil fuel industry generally. <laughs> It absolutely does. I mean, it's the exact same thing. And it's a very similar playbook, to be honest. The reality is that it's supporting point source burning of fossil fuels. And then, as you explained, the add-on emissions. That brings us to the bigger question, which is, what does this do to the climate goals for a state like New York, which wants to fa- phase out fossil fuels on a you know fairly rapid basis? How does this challenge their efforts if you have power plants like this that are zombified? I mean, the more zombie power plants you have, the harder it gets to meet those goals. Greenwich itself is looking to emit about a million tons of carbon dioxide a year, which is a not inconsequential amount. Um, That alone doesn't mean that New York can't meet its climate goals, but it means that everyone else needs to work a little bit harder. Um, And so that's, I think, what you know, one of the fundamental issues is here is that these power plants that are being turned into Bitcoin mines, I mean, they're making money and they're providing some revenues to these towns. But a lot of it's just getting shipped off to investors in other states and what have you. Um, And at the same time, they're making it harder for people living in New York to meet their climate goals. So, you know, that is the tension that essentially exists here. And that is, I think, what this fight at the end of the day is really all about. So over the last decade and a half, we've seen tens of thousands of megawatts of coal plants shut down because they're uneconomic either because they can't compete with natural gas or renewables or because they require pollution controls. And now it sounds like it's totally possible that a lot of plants that could have shut down for the benefit of the local environment and climate could be taken back, could be put back into commission because of these Bitcoin mines. It's absolutely possible that those plants could come back just like Greenwich did. And that, I think, is the biggest concern here is that if you are a Bitcoin mining company, if you are a private equity firm, or if you're a venture capitalist, You can be looking at what's happening here with this plant. And if these permits do go through, and if it is allowed to continue operating, that is essentially you're looking at the blueprint for how to buy a power plant and vertically integrate a Bitcoin mine into it and make millions of dollars. And so that is actually the biggest concern I think there is here, is not just what happens in this one place, although that certainly matters, it's what could happen across the region. So when you drove away from the Finger Lakes and saw the problem firsthand, Does this feel like a problem that we are only just beginning to wrap our heads around? In some ways, it does feel that way. I think one of the challenges is that there's not enough alarm about this. Because right now, this is the Wild West. I mean, it is the absolute Wild West in terms of what's happening, where states are not setting up regulations to both deal with the environmental impacts as well as the financial ones. So should I divest from my crypto kitties? I'm sorry, Stephen. You got to let them go. (laughs) (laughs) That's Brian Kahn. He's Protocol's climate editor. And make sure to read his story. We'll link to it in the show notes. It's worth your time. And while you're there, click through and take our survey. It'll take you a couple minutes and it will help us create content that's more relevant to what you want to hear about. 
The Carbon Copy is a co-production of Postscript Media and Canary Media. Our Postscript producers are Jamie Kaiser, Alexandria Herr, Cecily Mesa Martinez, Dalvin Abawaje, and Daniel Waldorf. Anne Bailey is our editor. Sean Marquand and Greg Vilfrank are our engineers. Original music came from Echo Finch and Blue Dot Sessions. Postscript Media is supported by Prelude Ventures. Prelude is a venture capital firm that partners with entrepreneurs to address climate change across a range of sectors. Those include advanced energy, food and agriculture, transportation and logistics, advanced materials and manufacturing, and advanced computing. Go ahead and give us a rating and review on Apple or Spotify. Send us your thoughts on social media. We want to hear from you. And uh, send this show to a friend or colleague if you think they should hear it. I'm Stephen Lacey. This is The Carbon Copy. We'll catch you next time. Mm